name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. A few years ago, uh, you could go to Iowa and have a conversation uh, with a preacher there. Uh, very accommodating she was. She was called Pam Banisha. And you found her favour especially if you gave her a plate of marshmallows. She would take the marshmallows in quick succession, popping them into, into her mouth, and every now and again uh, she would pop a marshmallow into your mouth as a gesture of friendship. She had a sense of fun. One of her favourite games was to put a twig into her ear, and then she would laugh as uproariously. Or she might put a twig into your ear, which she found equally funny. Or she had a game of hide and seek. She would make great play of finding a field place to hide, and then instantly she would find you, and again laugh uproariously. And she had a sense of generosity, as she would do chores like sweeping the floor in exchange for bracelets. But every now and again she went on strike and insisted that you gave bracelets to her friends as well, so they all shared her pleasure. And she didn't have a voice, she didn't have a vocal cord, vocal cord to the way that we do. Uh, but she had about a hundred distinct sounds that she made some of, uh, that each seemed to have a meaning. And a very clever scientist worked out what these meanings were and created a kind of voice synthesizer, like the one Stephen Hawking had, so that her sounds would come out as an English word. So she could say things like marshmallow toast visitor, and that meant you, the visitor, must toast the marshmallows before you give them to me. Uh, so, as I say, she had a vocabulary of about 100 words. Her greatest accomplishment is that she could play a simple keyboard instrument, not quite as well uh, as Fraser does, but nonetheless commendably. And on one occasion, uh, the musician Isa Gabriel, the later Genesis, had a jam session with her, and it was quite successful. But then, in 2012, she died, uh, age 26, which is quite young. And she was, in fact, a bonobo, not a human being, as you may guess, but a bonobo. And the bonobo is our nearest genetic cousin. Uh, they share 98% of our DNA. But as they say, one day, she died in 2012. And what happened was this. Uh, a young man with a streaming cold came to see her and got too close. He didn't observe social distancing, which is especially important with bonobos. Uh, as a consequence of which, uh, his germs uh, were transmitted to uh, uh, Pan Pandemicia, uh, and she got the cold, and her immune system had no way of resisting it, uh, so within a few days uh, she had succumbed. And the whole of America went to, into a kind of collective grief. They had taken Pandemicia to their hearts. She'd even appeared on the opera Winfrey Show, which is the ultimate accolade for anybody. Uh, so there was a very strong sense of bond with her and a sense of grief uh, when she died. But then that grief turned into guilt. It was that she had died by human agency, and somehow the whole of America uh, was complicit uh, in this death by a cold. So there was a sense of guilt. Now, this little story of Pan Alicia uh, is indicative of one of the strange things about us human beings. We're far stranger than bonkers. And one of the strange things is that we feel more of an affinity with animals and more affection towards them than we do to one another. And last Sunday afternoon, uh, I was walking back home and going through the sense of cage. Uh, and there was a lady with a basket with two very small spaniel puppets. There are also children in pushchairs and prams and so on around the place. Absolutely no interest was shown to the little children. But the whole of Cambridge wanted to drool over these lovely spaniel puppets. They were the most popular thing you could imagine uh, in the whole city. Uh, we are very attached to animals. When I was 10, uh, my parents were very present. I decided what I needed was a dog. Uh, and they brought for me a small miniature poodle, a black poodle dog. Uh, and this poodle dog was my closest companion uh, through the turbulent years of adolescence. Uh, I would tell them Mumbo, by the way, and some of you may know the references to a children's book. And Mumbo and I uh, frequently went on Hampstead Heath. Uh, she would run out for a bit, uh, and then she would come and sit beside me. And I would pour out my deepest thoughts to Mumbo, uh, and I think she responded. I kind of sensed a response. It was a slightly one-sided conversation, but nonetheless it was there. 
Uh, and as I say, she was kind of stable factor in all the comings and goings of the investors. There she was, not her. Uh, now that leads us to a question uh, which priests normally hate to be asked, but which is high on the theological agenda of most lay people. Do animals get to heaven? Will they have eternal life? Now, some people are convinced one way or the other. Uh, I had a friend at school who had his own dog that he was equally devoted to as I was in London. Uh, but he was a Roman Catholic. Uh, and uh, on one occasion, he asked him, he went weekly, he had to go to a convent for religious instruction, which he hated. But on one occasion, uh, he asked the nuns, uh, will my dog, I forget the dog's name, get to heaven? Uh, and the nun, I'm quite sure, spoke with an Irish accent. Ah, oh, she was, uh, I won't even attempt to have an Irish accent. Uh, and said, no, your dog will certainly not get to heaven. How could you think such an irreligious thing? Uh, but he was persistent. Uh, how could he believe in a God which condemned his dog to death? He thought that was terrible. Uh, well, the nun got so angry uh, that she delivered uh, ten sharp uh, bangs on the palm of his hand with a ruler, and then sent him away to say, I'm team, uh, hey, I'm uh, She didn't convince him by the way. So some people are sure one way, and then other people are sure the other way. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, was convinced that animals do get to heaven, that heaven will be peopled by lots of lovely spaniel dogs and mumbos and so on. Uh, so which is right. But the reason why most clergymen hate to be asked that question is they think the Bible isn't clear. The Bible doesn't seem to give an answer. Well, I want to suggest the Bible gives a very clear answer. You have to look at the very beginning of the Bible and then look at the very end. Now, the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, precisely, uh, contains a vivid description uh, of the Garden of Eden, with every kind of life, insects, birds, animals, uh, fish, no doubt, or there's no mention of it. I don't think there's fish. Anyway, lots and lots of creatures of all kinds. And in the middle of the garden is a tree of life from which this temporal life comes to all creatures. Then we turn to the back of the Bible, uh, to the very last few verses in the last chapter, and the tree of life makes another appearance. And now it's giving eternal life to those in heaven. Now it's inconceivable that the tree of life would be less generous in heaven than on earth. And even. So surely it's the case uh, that the tree of life gives life to all the animals and fish and so on that have died, just in the way that the tree of life will give life to us in the glory of heaven. So I am quite convinced, on biblical grounds, as well as I think on emotional grounds, uh, that we will indeed be reunited uh, with all the pets and the lovely animals uh, that we've enjoyed on this earth. I shall be reunited with Mumbo, and also with my two guinea pigs, uh, Peter and Paul, although Paul later turned out to be Paul, uh, and those umpteen gold goldfish that I won uh, on the fun fairs at Hampstead. They will all uh, be present in heaven, along with all the lovely animals uh, that you love. Now, in 1972, Mumbo was 12, uh, or 84 in doggy years. I hope you might find that And she was diagnosed with cancer, and it was so far gone that she was inoperable. So she came back to die. Now, the hallway uh, where I grew up was quite a wide grand thing, uh, with a staircase leading off it, uh, and Mumbo deposited itself on the fifth stair up. I have an absolutely vivid recollection of there was Mumbo, fifth stair up. And the point was, she could observe people coming and going through the front door without having to move. Well, it so happened that at that time, Sarah and I were preparing to go uh, for a year to Ethiopia. Uh, and there we all were in the hallway, rucksacks already, first stop, Hampstead Tube Station. Uh, and there was Mumbo. Now, I knew that this, this was the last time I would see Mumbo. But Mumbo also knew that this was the last time she, see, she would see me. And so she rose uh, from her step, tottered down the five steps, clearly in terrible pain, and came over to me. I went down, and she gave me a last loving thing, and then tottered back up and re resumed her spot on the fifth step. Up. She fell up the tears to remember it. Uh, and that's the mum moment. Uh, that I look forward uh, to meeting again uh, after death in the great glorious uh, resurrection of the 
And incidentally, thinking of tokens of love, not those late, uh, Pandanisha had her own token of love, of love, and it was a very long lasting token. If she favored you, then as you left her, she was, by the way, in a great age too, as you left her, uh, with unerring accuracy, she would urinate on your feet. <laughs> Uh, and however much you tried to brush the thing and scrub it and wash it and so on, the smell was always there. Uh, so while you had that pair of shoes, you had a permanent token uh, of Pantanisha's love. And as the song goes, love is a many splendid thing.